This music is based on a computer memory cell. And so is this. This too. Now, I'm not talking about an actual physical memory cell here. I'm a software guy, not a hardware guy, so this is more like an idealized representation of the kind of memory cell you'd find in your computer's RAM. You've got your capacitor here, which stores a high or low voltage corresponding to a binary value of 1 or 0. Then here in the middle is your transistor, which acts like a switch, turning on and off your ability to write to memory. And then finally, you have your two input channels. The so-called bit line, which carries the high or low voltage to write to memory, and the word line, which turns on and off the transistor. Maybe that was a lot, so let's slow things down and play with this interactive diagram. When the transistor is switched on via a high voltage in the word line, the bit line becomes electrically connected to the capacitor, causing the capacitor to take on whatever voltage is present in the bit line. This is how we write to memory. On the other hand, when the transistor is switched off via a low voltage in the word line, the connection between the bit line and the capacitor is broken, causing the capacitor to hold on to its most recently stored value. This is how we store something in memory. Of course, there are many other details, like how the information is read or the process of memory refreshing, but this is the core process by which memory is probably being stored in your computer's RAM right now. This interactive diagram, by the way, is part of a course on how technology works from Brilliant. Brilliant is a sponsor of this channel, which is exciting because it's given me a chance to explore their catalog of courses and find unusual musical inspirations. I'll say more at the end of the video, but for now, if you're interested in playing with this diagram yourself, head to brilliant.org slash Mark Evanstein, or click the link in the description. Anyway, when I first saw this diagram, it made me think of counterpoint. See, when you're writing counterpoint for multiple voices, these voices of course have a degree of freedom, but also impose restrictions on one another. So I wondered, what would it sound like to make music from these two free voices, along with this third voice that's a special kind of combination of the first two? Now, the first step in making music from something like this is to come up with a scheme for converting a single binary stream of zeros and ones to music. I envisioned this kind of like a machine that takes in zeros and ones at some regular interval and uses them to generate or influence some music. For example, a simple and rather boring way to do this might be to play one sound for a zero and a different sound for a one. Or to make the rhythm a little less monotonous, instead of playing on every subdivision, we could play only when the value changes. Of course, there's no reason why both digits have to be treated the same way. What if instead we let 0 be a rest, and 1 be a held chord? Or perhaps 0 plays a series of staccato notes that lead up to the chord. You can see that there's already considerable variety here, but all of these still fall under the category of directly mapping digits to sounds or notes. A different approach might be to have the digits act as a control signal for a more abstract property of the music. Here, the music is a constantly running scale, with the zeros and ones determining the direction, up or down, with which we move along the scale. I actually found a variant of this which produced a kind of interesting result. Ones cause the melody to rise by just perfect fifths, and zeros cause it to fall by just major thirds. Because these intervals aren't tempered, the tuning drifts over time. Also, since fifths are larger than thirds, I made it so that it doesn't rise for every single value of one. Anyway, I think you get the idea. As you already know from the variety of things you can do with your computer, a stream of binary digits can literally encode anything. So of course the same is true in a musical context. By the way, I'm putting the code to all of this up on my Patreon. 
I'm trying something new and making it free, but if you want to sign up for a paid tier, you'll get access to lots of other fun stuff as well. Of course, the music that results from all of this depends not only on the mapping, but also on the streams of ones and zeros themselves. Obviously, there are an infinite number of possible bit streams, but let's explore three of the most obvious possibilities. Repeating patterns, random values, and the ASCII text of the Da Vinci Code. A repeating pattern might be something like a zero, followed by two ones, followed by three zeros, followed by another one, over and over. Using a simple percussion sonifier, you get a loop like this. And using the scale direction sonifier, you get something like this. Of course, the patterns can be longer, and they can contain longer blocks of ones or zeros, which has a somewhat different effect. As for random patterns, of course, you can simply pick randomly between zero and one each time. Or you could weight one choice more than the other. Alternatively, you could have the random variable determine whether or not to flip the bit. Depending on the probability, you get a spectrum of different kinds of streams. If you set that probability low, you get long blocks of ones or zeros. As you increase the flip probability, these blocks get shorter and shorter until it starts alternating with nearly every bit. As for the Da Vinci Code, a simple Python script can convert the text of the book to ASCII integers, convert those integers to binary, and then concatenate them into a stream of zeros and ones. The result may sound pretty random, but something tells me there's a secret meaning behind it. So let's finally get back to the music I showed you at the beginning. Each of the three musical examples I showed at the beginning was created by applying different kinds of sonifiers to the values in the bit line, the word line, and the capacitor of our memory cell model. In this piano music, for instance, I had the bit line alternate between two high notes, the word line alternate between two low intervals, and I had the capacitor control the direction of a constantly flowing E Dorian scale. Here the bit line is being fed a repeating cycle, whereas the word line is being fed bits that are randomly flipping with a 15% probability. In the more percussion-oriented example, on the other hand, I had the bit line sonifying a random bit stream using single, double, and triple strokes on two cowbells. The word line, just as in the piano music, uses a random stream with a 15% chance of flipping. It performs a sustained roll on the timpani whenever the transistor is switched on, and a low single stroke whenever it's switched off. Finally, the capacitor alternates between repeated staccato Gs on a value of 0, and a crunchy held minor second on a value of 1. As for the slower, more unsettling music, we have congas on the bit line, sustained horns on the word line, and on the capacitor we have those rising fifths and falling thirds that I mentioned earlier, drifting harmonically over time. So, zooming out, as you listen to the different musical results here, do you hear the memory cell relationship? The way in which one stream is turning on and off the coupling between the two other streams? And can you think of other ways I could have gone about this? Also, I wonder what other musical rabbit holes we could go down together. 
You know what? Why don't you check out brilliant.org slash Mark Evanstein and send me some other ideas of courses or content that I could sonify. I genuinely think that this could be one of the coolest and weirdest YouTube sponsorships out there. So if you want to see more videos like this, hop on Brilliant, explore courses on creative coding, data analysis, or large language models, and comment below with your suggestions. While you're clicking the link, I'll just say that Brilliant is a lot more than a bunch of awesome interactive diagrams. The diagrams are part of a broader approach that steers your brain into active curiosity and problem solving, rather than passive consumption. The lessons were created by an award-winning team from places like MIT and Google, and it's just really well done. It always feels like the right questions are asked and the right context offered. And they've managed to break up complex topics into short lessons to help you make learning new things a daily habit. You can try Brilliant for free for a full 30 days and get 20% off an annual premium subscription at brilliant.org slash Mark Evanstein. Come on, people. Help me make some weird music. <laughs>